Welcome to the BC Search and Rescue Association's Adventure Smart Expert Webinar Series. Tonight, it's Sabrina Robson from Destination BC and Brent Hillier from the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides. I'd like to introduce our first guest from Destination BC. Sabrina Robson has been promoting travel in British Columbia for over 15 years. So she has some history behind her. In her role as manager, travel media relations at Destination British Columbia, Sabrina works with media from all across North America. So she has a big plate to cover there to create travel focused stories that inspire travelers to visit. Born and raised in British Columbia, which isn't all that common, uh, as much anymore. Sabrina is passionate about helping visitors and storytellers discover the beauty of her home province. When she's not working, which it sounds like she has a pretty good job to me, she's enjoying hiking with her rescue pup. Oh, well, that sounds like fun. Snowboarding and uncovering hidden gems around the province. I'd like to pass over the stage to Sabrina and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I am the uh, the acting manager of travel media relations here at Destination BC, and I have the incredible job of um, representing the the whole province and working with an amazing team of of partners in the promotion and sharing of stories of our beautiful province. I am a big winter enthusiast, a snowboarder myself. Here's my uh, classic photo <laughs> from up the top of Whistler Black Home here. And um, today I'll be providing just a, an overview of some of the opportunities for winter adventure here in the Sea to Sky Corridor to help inspire you to get outside and enjoy our beautiful backyard safely and responsibly. So the Sea to Sky Corridor is really one of the most iconic and, and well-traveled regions in BC. Uh, as many of you will know, there are endless opportunities for, for winter adventure here from the steep fjords of Howe Sound, uh, sheer rock faces, so lakes, alpine forests, glaciers, and uh, and oh so many mountains and uh, and trails to explore. So I will be focusing on the sea of sky with North and West Vancouver, Squamish, Whistler, and Pemberton, speaking to those communities specifically. So to kick things off, I figured I'd start with alpine skiing, which is um, you know, probably one of the most accessible um, uh, experiences, really. Um, how lucky are we to have Cypress Mountain, Grouse Mountain, and Seymour all less than a 30-minute drive from downtown Vancouver. Uh, these resorts all have verticals of at least 1,000 feet and showcase pretty incredible views of uh, the city. Um, and one of my favorite things about alpine skiing or snowboarding up at these resorts is that uh, the night skiing is spectacular. So for us uh, nine to fivers like myself, it uh, provides a great opportunity to get up and enjoy some outdoor recreation uh, during the work week. I've actually just heard some exciting news as well uh, that Seymour uh, is going to be reopening and expanding some of their uh, terrain and light of conditions. So uh, make sure you check out their website and, uh, and get a reservation there. And of course, I would be remiss not to mention uh, the incredible Whistler Blackcomb, uh, one of the top resorts in North America. Uh, with two mountains that combined over half for the 200 mark ski runs, over 3,000 hectares of terrain, 16 alpine bulls, and three glaciers with some incredible uh, slack country opportunities as well as uh, on mountain. Uh, Whistler boasts one of the longest ski seasons in North America, so although uh, the season might be off to a slower start, uh, rest assured you can ski up at Whistler uh, well through June. And there's lots of opportunities to improve your skills here um, or learn if you're a beginner. I participated in the women's snowboard camp for many years. And I tell you, it really did make all the difference for me and my confidence. Um, Whistler also has a pretty neat program where you can actually ski with an Olympian. Um, and as the official Alpine skiing venue of the 2010 games, you'll find many athletes that call Whistler home. 
I have a lot of great things to chat with you about today, so I won't uh, be able to share this video, but I do encourage you to check it out uh, on our Destination BC um, YouTube page, and I think Scott might share the link as well for you, but um, uh, one of those Olympians, Spencer O'Brien, an Indigenous athlete, uh, calls Whistler home, and um, in this video, she just shares uh, a little bit of what her connection to nature um, you know, means to her while snowboarding in our beautiful coast mountains. Adaptive ski experiences are also widely available in the region. Uh, Whistler's adaptive ski program um, has a number of experiences available for folks with both physical and cognitive disabilities and all um, skiing abilities as well. And um, here in Vancouver, the Vancouver Adaptive Snow Sports um, Organization operates um, all throughout uh, the three resorts, and they've actually been operating at Grouse Mountain since 1974, which is pretty incredible. Cross-country skiing is uh, another amazing way to get outside, uh, whether that's, you know, a little bit more flat terrain or as I know Scott Rudgett, he enjoys doing a little bit more of the, the ups and downs. Uh, you could stick to a groom track or forge your own path in the backcountry. Three of the, uh, some of the top places that you can go cross country skiing in the Sea to Sky Corridor with Cypress Mountain being, uh, being one with, of course, those sweeping city and ocean views. They have 19 kilometers of track set trails. Uh, and of course the home cooking at Hollyburn Lodge, um, which really do make it a favorite Nordic destination. And another plus, you know, the close proximity to the city, you can actually hop on the Cypress Mountain Express bus from several Vancouver area stops, which is pretty incredible to have that so close to us. Whistler Olympic Park, uh, a great legacy of the 2010 Olympic Winter Games, um, is just 25 or 24 kilometers north of Whistler. It has um, a ton of incredible trails that are extremely well-groomed and Olympic standard amenities. So alongside the Whistler Olympic Park Day Lodge, which has Grande Wine Cafe, there is a full service rental shop. They have lessons, they have discounted Wednesday night skiing, a kid's ski area, a toboggan hill, and even a lot of dog friendly trails for those of us who like to, uh, to get outside with our pups like myself. Uh, the Whistler Olympic Park has a biathlon range uh, where you can actually do uh, a, a shorter version of a biathlon experience if you're feeling adventurous. Um, and there is extensive backcountry touring uh, that can be accessed via uh, the Callahan Valley. So definitely a great one to check out. Um, in Pemberton, you'll find a ton of cross-country trails, many of which are found uh, around the area's golf courses and the farms and the communities. Um, and uh, one that I, I think is particularly interesting uh, in Pemberton um, is the Nairn Falls Trail. So Pemberton, uh, Nairn Falls and Pemberton Provincial Nairn Falls Provincial Park, pardon me, uh, in the summer is a popular destination for hiking out to the beautiful waterfalls. And in the winter, um, the roads and paths throughout the campground are actually groomed for cross-country skiing for both classic and skate. Snowshoeing is one of my favorite ways to get outside in the winter time. Uh, for those of us who enjoy hiking, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the most accessible and low impact winter activities there is. Um, although the challenge uh, is really up to you as there's so many amazing trails of varying abilities. Um, but beginners, kids and non-athletes can enjoy trekking through the bush in a winter forest as well. The sheer number of parks, resorts and wilderness areas in BC makes snowshoeing a winter favorite uh, for beginners and experienced snowshoers alike. Near Vancouver, we have the North Shore Mountains uh, that are easy to reach. Uh, there's many well well maintained trails accessible from Cypress Mountain, Seymour Mountain, Dog Mountain being one of my uh, personal favorites for a, a quick hike with uh, amazing views, um, and of course Grouse Mountain as well. And um, further afield, uh, in places like Squamish, you know many of the the trails that are so popular for hiking in the summer are a lot quieter in the winter time. Uh, the Four Lakes Trail in Squamish, which is just a beautiful um, and very accessible trail that takes you through a number of beautiful lakes. It just seeing it in the winter time gives you a totally different perspective and it's a lot quieter and you can really lose the crowds, which is great. 
And one of the advantages of uh, snowshoeing closer to some of those ski resorts or even uh, the Sea to Sky Gondola, for example, is that you can enjoy the great apres experiences, whether that's, you know, a hot cup of cocoa or, or a great pint of beer. So something to keep in mind. And snowmobiling um, is something that's really growing in popularity throughout BC and, and especially in the Sea to Sky Corridor. And uh, I think that's in part because of the easy access that it provides to uh, BC's incredible backcountry. So in Whistler, um, guided rides with you know, Canadian wilderness adventures might finish with a, a fondue dinner at a cabin in the woods. Or in Pemberton, um, sledders can snowmobile across a glacier. You can book a tour uh, with a company called Broken Boundary Tours, and they actually offer a snowmobile tour uh, to an ice fishing location where you can spend a full day, um, you know, cruising around on your snowmobile and hopefully catching some some fish for dinner as well. And backcountry touring, I will um, touch on this slightly as I know uh, we have another fantastic guest lined up for you, Brent, who will speak to this as well. But uh, backcountry touring has really gained in popularity in recent years uh, where skiers and snowboarders longing to ditch the crowds and uh, particularly, I think, throughout uh, the pandemic, uh, which, you know, a lot of people looking to get uh, to get away from the crowds and, and spend time outside for our mental health. For those curious about getting into the backcountry, I think a, a good place to start is by taking an introduction to ski touring in a backcountry course. Um, and that can be done by hiring a skilled uh, and talented guide, which you'll hear more about. Um, there are lots of courses wildly available, widely available, excuse me, in um, Vancouver, Squamish, and Whistler. Um, or you could take a guided tour if you just wanted to get out for a day. Um, there's a company in Whistler called Extremely Canadian uh, that takes guests out into the backcountry, both from Whistler and Pemberton and beyond. And um, flat country is a term that you might hear used as well, which um, refers to backcountry experiences that can be made available to you by, uh, in part, taking a list. So it cuts out a little bit of the legwork, but uh, still promises those epic views and, uh, and escaping the crowd. So uh, Whistler Blackcomb offers backcountry passes to those who wish to leverage the ski lift to start their adventure. Um, and one great option from there is the Spearhead Traverse, um, which is uh, connecting to uh, the Keys and Clare Hut, which is a, a gorgeous hut um, that was built a few years ago. That's the first of, I believe, three that are going to be built uh, that connect along this traverse. So um, you can spend the day, uh, you can snowshoe it as well, but uh, doing backcountry skiing and have a nice warm place to stay at, um, at the end of the night. Um, and similarly, uh, the Sea to Sky Gondola in Squamish is another great way to uh, take the gondola up and then immediately have access to a ton of, uh, of beautiful backcountry trails to explore. For those of you who might wish to venture a little bit further, um, there are lots of uh, backcountry huts in British Columbia um, and in the Sea to Sky Corridor in particular that, uh, that can help you extend your trip. <clears throat> so a few ideas to consider uh, in Squamish, uh, you could explore Tantalus Provincial Park or the many trails in Garibaldi Provincial Park, including the iconic Elfin Lakes Trail. If you do uh, choose to take the Elfin Lakes Trail, you can extend your trip with an overnight stay in the Red Heather Hut. And uh, back in the Callahan Valley, um, you'll find a comfortable backcountry stay at uh, Journeyman Lodge, which is a well-appointed backcountry inn that has great food and comfortable accommodation for 24 people. I'm seeing some hearts here, so I, 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 I'm expecting maybe some folks have had a stay there. It's uh, definitely well worth, uh, well, well worth the trip. And um, I'd like to just take a moment as well to, to speak to you a little bit about um, a great initiative that's being, uh, being undertaken by our destination management team. So 
you know, I, I work on the marketing team and get to, to share stories and travel ideas that help to inspire visitors. But another important part of our work at Destination BC um, is on our destination management team, where we really work with communities on both developing those experiences and, and, and ensuring that these places are protected um, and, and, you know, preserved in the long term so that we can continue to enjoy them for years to come. So the Sea to Sky Destination Education Initiative is something that's fairly new. Um, so you will be um, hearing more about it uh, in the future. But really, the goal is to develop and deliver communication initiatives that are aimed at ensuring that all of us understand the shared values of the communities in the region. And that really revolves around, you know, mutual respect, conducting yourself, um, you know, how to conduct yourself in the outdoors, important know before you go information, uh, resources around protecting our planet and, uh, and responsible social media. So um, Adventure Smart is an important partner in this initiative, um, as well as some of the local communities in the Sea to Sky Corridor. Um, you may have seen um, one of these initiatives that launched just last summer, which is called Don't Love It to Death. Um, and, uh, and I would encourage you to, uh, to check out um, the website. If you Google Don't Love It to Death Vancouver, you, you, you'll find some great resources there. But um, really just focused on, on helping people understand the impact uh, you know, and and how to how to be responsible when you're when you're camping, hiking, or just spending time in the outdoors, and that includes you know um, uh, wildlife encounters as well. So I feel like I've breathed through this here, but um, just to wrap, you know, I I, I want to say with with any outdoor uh, adventure, and and especially in the winter time, you know, it's it's important to be mindful of our surroundings, to bring extra food and water and clothing, as we all know uh, that mountain conditions can change quickly. And as you're planning your trips, hopefully, uh, I've I've given you a little bit more inspiration of things to uh, to see and do in our in our beautiful home this winter. Um, I'd encourage you to check in with your local visitor centers as well. Um, they have some incredible resources from maps and suggested trail routes. So they can give you the latest updates on current conditions. So be sure to stop in before you you head out into uh, into the great outdoors. So that's all for me. Thanks so much for uh, for having me, Sandra, again into Adventure Smart. It's been a real pleasure, and look forward to answering any questions um, after the presentation. So I'll hand it back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Sabrina. That was wonderful. It really gave us um, some great reminders for those of us who spend a lot of time up and down the Sea to Sky corridor, and hopefully some insights that people weren't aware of. I know Scott put some excellent additional information in the chat there for you. Uh, he is a dog advocate and wherever he can go with his, he will. And he does every weekend, actually. So there's some great bits and bobs too in the chat. Don't hesitate to, to read that. That compliments Sabrina's uh, pieces. Thanks for adding a little bit more extra there at the end, Sabrina, about the Don't Love It to Death campaign. I know that that is, is a wonderful opportunity for people to learn more about how we all frequently visit certain areas of the province and how we have to be a little bit more conscious of how we do and maybe other areas we could visit that would be just as exciting and just as fun and and be mindful of our time that we do play on those grounds and and how we impact them so thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention you brought up quite a few different organizations groups um, affiliates businesses that are a part of the Sea to Sky Corridor that offer resources and, and guiding trips and, and, and help everyone make their adventures even better. I'd like to add one little bit for our listeners tonight. If you head over to the BC Search and Rescue Association's website, it's where all of the BC Adventure Smart information and resources are housed. Head over to the Outdoor Education section. The first one on the list, there's only four things on the list, by the way, is called the Adventure Hub. The Adventure Hub is an online platform that houses more than 450 outdoor recreation businesses and organizations that can help you as an outdoor enthusiast learn a bit, a little bit more about different regions in the province. There's 24 categories to explore. You could figure out how are you gonna go hiking in Prince George? We're gonna have something there for you. Maybe there's a great podcast you want to listen to all about camping with your family. It's definitely on the Adventure Hub. 
avalanche training, backcountry and tourism, guiding, uh, mountain biking, the, the list goes on. Again, there's 24 categories. I really encourage you to have a visit to it. If you are a business owner or any of those that Sabrina mentioned tonight, we can add you to it. So just to let you know, just it's another great resource. We just launched it there in the fall. So thanks, Sabrina. Really appreciate Destination BC's uh, commitment to BC Adventure Smart and working together with us over the years. It's, it's always fun and exciting, and I can't wait for future collabs, that's for sure. Our next guest is coming back to join us. Actually, Brent's been here before, and I'm so glad he's he's taken the time and has the time. Let me rephrase that has the time to join us. Brent's been working in the outdoor industry since 2008, uh, a process a process that has meant more hard work and determination than he could ever imagined, actually. I'm sure he says that in a loving way, but on some days when it's overloaded, maybe a little bit differently, but still the love of the outdoors shines through. As a guide with the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides, ACMG, Brent has been teaching and guiding backpacking trips and specializes in adult education, focused on navigation and survival skills. As well, a multi-day backpacking program for high school and post-secondary programs are also what he facilitates. Brent's an outdoor educator, an avalanche professional, a hiking guide, a backcountry skier, a mountain biker, a trail builder, a fisherman, canoeist, ambassador, adventurer, and a very, very passionate, enthusiastic father. Brent's busy, so we appreciate his time. Let's jump right over to him. And all of those accomplishments make him an easy, perfect guest for our session tonight. Brent, the stage is yours. Thanks for coming back. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, this is, uh, you've caught me at a great time. I'm coming out of the backcountry, so I've got a, a great little backcountry glow on right now. I uh, just spent uh, three days, two nights out in the Marriott Basin. And uh, what I want to do is kind of walk you through uh, that trip, and, and there's a bunch of great uh, kind of safety points that I'd love to share. So I'm just going to share a slideshow here. Awesome. There we go. So I do uh, most of my work with uh, Canada West Mountain School. And uh, so they are uh, an outdoor education uh, company. Um, they offer guiding services as well as uh, all sorts of education courses. Um, a lot of my work that I do in the winter is teaching avalanche courses. Uh, but I'm just coming off of uh, three days out with a, a school program. So a lot of the work that I do in February is with uh, school programs and uh, doing winter camping trips, which is uh, one of my favorite things to do is to to kind of help facilitate um, people to to get out and, and do adventures that um, that a lot of people might consider to be a, a bit much um, or, or hard to kind of tackle on their own. And winter camping is definitely one of them. There's a lot of uh, aspects of winter camping, which you're going to see in a, a couple photos here. Uh, that can be really challenging, but there's a, a bunch of other aspects of winter camping that uh, can be really rewarding. And so, um, like so many trips, uh, the very first thing that you want to kind of do is is that planning phase. And I always like to make notes, especially on on overnight trips uh, where I'm I don't have cell service. So a lot of the resources that I use in the planning phase um, is Avalanche.ca or uh, all sorts of different weather apps and, and websites. But as soon as I kind of start hiking out there on the trail, I don't have access to a lot of that stuff. And so I have this little right in the rain and I like to add notes in here. So, um, a, you know, a little bit of scribbles and some kind of shorthand stuff here. But the big one is is kind of the avalanche danger rating. So it was moderate up in the Alpine at the very top of the mountain. But where we were spending our time was was at tree line and below tree line. And, uh, and that was low avalanche hazard, which was great. I also like to to make notes of things like the sunrise and the sunset, especially when I'm winter camping, because uh, the sun is is such an important part of of that. So here's a, an example of all those different danger rating scales. So with avalanche dangers, we we start at the the bottom, uh, which is low, and all the way to the the very extreme end of the scale with uh with black or extreme. And then for this particular trip, because we were kind of in low avalanche hazard, one of the other tools that I I like to utilize is this evaluator trip planner and you can see on the the one column on the left there it's got those danger ratings low moderate considerable high and extreme and and then what i like to do is kind of cross reference that to the type of terrain that's going to be appropriate so thankfully with low avalanche hazard it, it allows us to use normal amounts of caution in both simple and challenging terrain and so uh, then we can use this trip planner, which is on uh, the avalanche.ca website. And it's just under the, the resources tab. Um, but the big thing that I wanna kind of highlight here, this is uh, where we were parking. Um, this is the Marriott Basin. And then the Wendy Thompson hut is just kind of over here. And, uh, and this 
um, area is, is absolutely gorgeous. And you can see that the majority of our travel is on simple terrain, which is wonderful. And we've got one little section right here, which goes through challenging terrain. And that's kind of where that decision point thing is. I'll talk more about that when I actually get to those photos of, of that part of the trip. But um, it sets us up for success because we know that the majority of this trip is going to be in simple terrain. So even if the danger rating was a bit higher than low, it's a, a manageable, manageable trip for the, the current conditions. Um, here's the, the parking area. Uh, this is known as the the sand shed, um, and, and uh, this is uh, how you access the Marriott Basin or the Wendy Thompson Hut. Um, and there's a, a good amount of parking that's all around there. Sometimes you'll come back after a, a snowy trip to a little bit of shoveling uh, to get your vehicle out from a plow, kind of pushing snow uh, up against the side. The plow drivers are are great. I've, I've never had any issues with uh, with any damage to my vehicle, but I certainly have had to dig a lot up there, which is just part of traveling and recreating in the winter time so um, this is where we parked and then uh and then it was time to kind of head out so very excited uh, a very heavy backpack um but uh excited to kind of hit the trails i was snowshoeing um with this particular school group um so just to, to kind of keep things a little bit safer because because there are some additional risks to skiing we uh we always choose to, to or for the most part we choose to go snowshoeing and that way kids who don't ski can also come along on the trip which is great um one of the things that we we started with is a transceiver check. So everybody had a, a shovel, uh, a beacon, and a probe or an avalanche transceiver. That's my uh, post-trip pizza that's arriving. Just ignore that. <laughs> and uh, and so um, that transceiver check is important to do. We want to make sure that everybody is sending. Uh, and, uh, and then that way, if anything were to happen, we'd be able to find them with those transceivers. Um, this year has been interesting, for sure, to say the least. I think a lot of people are, are aware of that. Uh, we've had a, a kind of a low snow year, what some people call low tide, uh, as far as winter goes. But there was snow right down to the very bottom. And uh, and if you're skiing, it, it's a little bit tricky. There's kind of sections that you'd have to hop over or take your skis off. But on snowshoes, those are a little bit more manageable. So this is kind of some of the, the conditions that we found on the, the lower section of the trail. And then we kind of worked our way up. And uh, this is the trailhead there. There's that that um, uh, trip planner that we were looking at earlier with the simple, the challenging, and the complex terrain. They've got that posted on the, the signboard, which is great. So as we kind of move up the mountain, we get to some really nice views here where we, we bust out into what we call tree line, which is there's fewer trees and more open patches of snow, which um, means better skiing, uh, means more sun, um, but also increases the, the chances that we'll find terrain that could produce avalanches. So larger openings, um, areas that aren't uh, densely treed are going to be more prone to avalanches. So um, we need to start kind of keeping our eyes out and where we're going and, and navigating. This is the, the famous creek crossing that's on the trail up to the Wendy Thompson hut. Um, and I was a little bit nervous about this because I didn't know how much snow was going to be at this point, but um, there's a log kind of hidden um, under there, which in the summer, the log is, is very manageable to walk across. And in the winter, uh, it's for the most part, generally easy to walk across that log because the log's completely gone and it's just a wide snow bridge. But in those low tide years, it's like a icy, snowy log that's really kind of sketchy on skis or, or shoes. So thankfully, there's enough snow at that elevation. So it was, uh, it was fine to cross. And this is where we get to that decision-making point here. So this is where we really start to get into some bigger terrain. And you can kind of see some really big slopes just uh, above us there. And so we need to kind of be aware of, of what we're walking underneath of. Um, and this is uh, what's known as the, the Climax Avalanche Path. And um, uh, happy to kind of see it uh, in some respects, not a lot of snow up there. Um, which uh, is a bummer in some aspects, but as far as the avalanche risk, um, it's a, a little bit more manageable um, because uh, we know that avalanches aren't, go aren't gonna go as big uh, with as much snow. Um, here's that section of the map. So you can see we're, uh, we're right here at that decision-making point, And this is where we need to kind of better understand our exposure to these overlapping avalanche paths. So because uh, there's not as much snow up in the very top here, and our avalanche danger is low, we felt comfortable kind of walking through this area right here. Um, most people take this path. And, and to be honest with you, the, the exposure to that overhead risk is for the most part minimal. 
Um, in fact, when we drive on highways around BC, we're often exposed to overhead avalanche risk, but the odds of, of a natural avalanche occurring and coming down on us is, is rare. So if we kind of combine that with, you know, avoiding those areas during high avalanche hazard or extreme avalanche hazard, the, the risk is pretty minimal. But because I'm with a school program, our risk tolerance is way lower than I if I was just out there kind of with some friends. So um, we really need to be careful as we kind of walk through these sections here. Um, this is a, a view from the other side. So that's the avalanche path just kind of in the trees there. And then the run out down here at the bottom, which we're all the way kind of out of camera, uh, just as far away from that avalanche path as possible. So if anything happens, the avalanche isn't going to reach us. But you can see in the top left corner, that's what's called the, the start zone. And there's a lot of snow or can be a lot of snow in certain years. And, and thankfully, this particular year, there's not as much snow up there. And thankfully, we're dealing with low avalanche hazard. So we kind of continued walking through that area. Um, but we did see signs of other avalanches. These were from kind of days earlier, maybe even a, a week earlier. Um, but there was some kind of debris down here in one of the gullies um, from avalanches that happened in the last storm cycle. So there's definitely signs of things happening out there. But uh, a good, good thing for us is they're not running very far. And that's always uh, uh, something you kind of make note of when you see that stuff. Um, then we get to, I believe this is called Lower Marriott Lake, and I always get it confused because it seems really high up there, but there's another lake that's further up. Um, and so with Lower Marriott Lake, um, normally in the winter, we're, we're not concerned at all about uh, crossing um, these lakes. Um, but this particular year, we've had a lot of thaw cycles and a lot of rainstorms. And so we've needed to, uh, to be more careful on these lakes. And so, um, you know, just digging through the snow there and making sure that we've got solid thick ice underneath of there. And, and sure enough, things were, were solid on that lake. So that allows us to kind of uh, walk a little bit more of a, a straighter line across the lake as opposed to uh, having to kind of wiggle around and, and spend more time. Um, pulling out the map at this point, we were right at that lake. So it's a good spot for us to kind of definitively know where we are on that map. And there's the Wendy Thompson hut just right there. So we're not terribly far. Um, we've got a little push up through the trees, like 100 meters of elevation. Um, probably uh, more mentally exhausting that last 100 meters of elevation because we're so close to getting to our destination. Um, and, and so a little push up there. And, and then we thankfully arrived at the hut. That's the, the Wendy Thompson hut. Um, it's a, an a ACC, an Alpine, uh, 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 Alpine Canada uh, club um, hut, and uh, it's a reservable hut, so you can't just go up there um, and expect to, to be able to stay there. You have to reserve it. Um, so, uh, so go to the Alpine Club of Canada's website and, uh, and make those reservations. It's a wonderful hut. Um, the, the school that I was working with, they had had it booked out. So the, the students actually chose to sleep in the hut <laughs> the first night. Um, and then, uh, and then we built, uh, Quincy's on the second day, which are like snow shelters and all the kids slept in these snow shelters on the, the second night. Um, I chose to sleep outside of the hut, uh, because it's quieter than sleeping in a hut with a bunch of teenagers. Uh, so <laughs> I, I had to get to start on my shelter pretty quickly because the, the sun was starting to disappear already. So one of the first things I do is just kind of check out how deep is the snow out there. And uh, it's about 160 centimeters, which is great. So that gives me enough snow to kind of dig. I like to stomp out my area for my little snow shelter. And then uh, trying something new that I learned a couple of years ago, I use these, uh, these, these are golf ball size wiffle balls. And I use those as snow anchors instead of kind of snow stakes. They're a little bit lighter um, and, uh, and normal tent pegs don't work in snow as well. Um, so you dig kind of a hole and you put that, that wiffle ball down there as a snow anchor. And then you kind of fill that in and you stomp it down and, and uh, they work quite well, especially here on the coast where we kind of have more wet, heavy snow. Um, and as I was kind of digging out my shelter, uh, I needed a bit of a soup break. So made some tea, made some soup to warm up a little bit. And that sun had kind of disappeared at that point. It wasn't quite sunset, but it was starting to get very cold very quickly. Um, so I was uh, thankfully staying warm just by digging a lot. So there's my little tent there. It's a, it's a floorless tent. And uh, what's great about these floorless tents is uh, you can dig them out and uh, make them into these wonderful cozy little homes. So this was what it looked like the, the first night. 
Um, and I made it a little bit cozier the, the second night, but I've got a nice bench there on the left and then, uh, and then my bed on the right. And um, you can use these shelters for sleeping in. You can sleep up to four people in these shelters um, or you can use them as cook shelters. And I've had like up to six, six people in these, even more. Um, so they're fun if you're having like just a, a, a nice little, you know, chocolate fondue night, nighttime hike type of trip or, or you're going out there for, for multiple nights. So now that it's dug, I, I can be a little bit more comfortable. So I'm very happy about that um, uh, because it's now already minus 12 degrees Celsius. It got cold pretty fast and it got down to about minus 17 uh, that night. Um, but these shelters are so cozy and warm. I made some dinner and drank lots of soup and kind of hung out in there and, and it was uh, nice and cozy. Um, one of the new things I got for this trip, I got this uh, packable uh, lantern. So you can see up in the top of the photo there, there's this foldable lantern and it just makes these shelters so nice. It was lovely. There's a, a nighttime photo of the, the Wendy Thompson hut. It's such a, a gorgeous uh, hut up there. It's uh, it's really quite beautiful. It was tons of stars out there. It was so great, but it gets quite cold at night. So I crawled into my sleeping bag and uh, no photos uh, for, for those moments because my arms were tucked in that sleeping bag and it was dark. You probably wouldn't have been able to see anything there. But uh, then the sun came up and because I knew not only when the sun was going to come up, but I also like to, to look up um, at what uh, bearing the sun is going to rise uh, for this time of year. I always like to position my tent in the perfect spot. I don't always get it right but I nailed it this time around. I had the sun just come up in the exact spot that I thought it would, and uh, which was great. Uh, very excited about the sun. And, uh, and then we spent the day um, building snow shelters with the kids, which were really fun. So we did Quincy's, which is where you pile snow and then the kids will dig them out and they made these huge Quincy's and they all slept in there um, the second night, which was awesome. And I took some time to kind of dig out my shelter a little bit better. So I dug out the other side, that way I could have some company over for lunch, which was nice. And so I had a, a second bench that was dug in there. Um, and then it was about 11 o'clock. So, you know, I was I was gonna get hungry in probably an hour. And one of the things you need to do when you're winter camping is uh, is make sure that your food's not frozen by the time you, you decide to eat it. So you do things like shove it in your pocket or I took advantage of the sun and kind of let these, uh, my little lunch snacks, um, uh, warm up a little bit in the sun as well. I charged that lantern. That's that foldable lantern that I showed you earlier. So it was, I was very happy with that little tool. It was uh, uh, something I will bring often, I think on trips. So it's charging in the, the sun. There's uh there's kind of the finished product of, of the shelter fully dug out. So I got another bench on the side there. So in this kind of format, it's really great to sleep. Uh, you can sleep two people in here really comfortably. And then, and then also use it as a cook shelter for like, up to six people, which is lovely. Um, if you've ever hung out with me at any point, you'll know that I'm very passionate about my charcuterie uh, and I'm even more passionate about my backcountry charcuterie. So there's my little lunch there with the sun just sneaking into that little corner. It was so lovely there. It was, uh, it was such a great time. So that was, uh, that was great. Some more tea, constantly drinking tea. Uh, it's always hard to stay hydrated. Uh, when you're out in the backcountry, especially when it's cold, you kind of feel like you don't need to drink water. And the thought of drinking cold water can be really challenging. So uh, when I'm winter camping, I am drinking uh, tons and tons of tea or hot chocolate or apple cider, um, whatever it is, but lots of fluids to try to, to stay hydrated out there. Uh, one of the things I never go out in the backcountry without is, is uh, my inReach. So this is a, a satellite communication device. So I was able to, to send some messages and receive some messages, got a lovely happy Valentine's Day from my wife out there, as well as a, a, a check-in on the, the weather. Um, so you can get weather updates. That's what a, a weather update can look like uh, on an inReach device. So it's it's uh, not much, but it tells you kind of the how cold it's gonna get, as well as the, the wind direction and speed. And it was clear, 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 clear. The whole time we were out there, it was absolutely amazing. So, and then, uh, you know, after spending the whole day kind of digging and making shelters, it was back to kind of darkness again. And so another kind of cold night out there, but uh, the kids uh, did great in their snow shelters. 
Um, it was wonderful. Um, and it was certainly a, a, a little bit of a, a colder night, but the Quincy's are actually quite warm. So they can actually be zero degrees Celsius, even if it's like minus 20 outside. It's really quite amazing. My snow shelter is a little bit colder than that, <laughs> but uh, managed to survive. And then the the last thing to do is the, the next morning was to kind of pack up. And one of the things that's really important uh, to do anytime that you go out into the backcountry and you you dig a hole, whether that hole is for um, uh, some sort of a, a, a snow profile or you're digging a hole for your tent like this, it's very important that you that you uh, cover it uh, when you're done. So that's what it looks like with the tent removed. And here's what it looks like kind of naturalized. So we talk a lot about leave no trace principles when we camp in the summer, but it's very important to have leave no trace principles in the winter as well. And even though snow melts, um, these holes can kind of look pretty gross and, and disgusting out there. And they're also uh, hazardous as well. So it's very important to, to not leave these kind of booby traps out there in the mountains, especially um, on slopes. Uh, and especially like a little dusting of snow or, or a little bit of snow over top of them, you can fall into them. And I've, I've seen people get injured. Um, there was a, a pretty bad head injury that happened on the North Shore a couple of years ago from somebody kind of skiing into uh, one of these holes. So it's very, very important uh, that you fill any hole that you dig out in the backcountry in the wintertime. And it just looks a lot nicer. So one, one snowstorm, we'll cover that all off. And, uh, and it looks really nice. Um, said goodbye to the the hut uh until next time uh i'll definitely be up there over the summer i love hiking in this area in the summer i don't know if i'll get up there again this winter but uh said goodbye to that and then started our our hike out and these views are just they never get old i every time i get out of my shelter when i'm up in this area it's just wow it's just it's so amazing to be up here i, I love this spot very much there's the lake again we're gonna hike across the lake and then we get back down to the trees and uh, it was, the travel in the trees was was quite nice, actually. There's like 20, 30 centimeters on a, on an ice crust. So I was expecting kind of icier conditions. And so we had uh, our, our yak tracks and, and crampons kind of packed, but uh, the snowshoes were all we needed, which was great. So for traction and back to civilization or at least a sand shed and uh, back to the vehicles. Um, so what I would like to finish with is just recommending uh, a couple of, of courses for folks to take. There's the AST1, which is the Avalanche Skills Training course, the level one course. That's going to kind of give you a basic introduction to how to understand avalanche terrain, as well as how to read and interpret those avalanche bulletins and use the trip planner that we kind of looked at briefly there. And then the AST2 course is a great course for those of you that have been doing more backcountry trips, but maybe are taking on a, a little bit more of a leadership role with folks in your group. And then the other thing that I really recommend is, is a, a navigation course. Um, we say a lot that if snow is the problem, terrain is the solution, but it's important that you have those navigational skills because you don't want to end up in an area that you don't want to be in, especially when it comes to uh, avalanche uh, exposure. And then one of my favorite courses to teach through the summer as we kind of approach spring, hopefully not too soon, um, is a, a wilderness survival course. And this is about just kind of uh, making sure that if something goes wrong, whether it's an injury or you get lost, that you're able to kind of hunker down and survive out there long enough for search and rescue to kind of get to you within, within 24 hours. And uh, uh, I, uh, all those courses can be found at the Mountain School. There's also a ton of other wonderful providers across the whole province um, that can offer similar courses um, out there as well. So I highly recommend that. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Brent. That was awesome. Thank you, Brent. Once again. Yeah, thank you. We've got a lot of questions, so we should crack right into them. Uh, my awesome. first question is, uh, I'll, I'll throw it over to you, Brent. Uh, if someone wants to go on a guided thing, like, uh, do they end up like, do you end up having to do like a one on one guide thing if it's just myself and my wife? Or do they have like, things where there's a guide and then a whole bunch of different people get together and you have a, a group going? Let's say you wanted to go yeah, to Wendy Thompson Hut. There yeah, there's certainly options out there. There's a lot of providers that kind of have set dates and set trips. And then those usually the costs are a little bit lower with those because um, there's higher ratios. 
Um, but then there's also lots of courses. So there's courses like a winter camping course that might go to a specific area. And I, my specialty is, is always with the teaching aspect of things. And I find a lot of people here in BC like to learn the skills. Um, and so it's not always uh, necessarily going on a guided trip, but taking like a winter camping course, you can kind of learn those skills. And then there's always options to just hire a guide and, and say, I want to go here. And, and uh, that guide can, can try to get you there as safely as possible. And, and so that's always an option. And the name of that show, that was Wendy Thompson Hutt, the one that you were talking about in Marriott Basin, right? Yeah, yeah, Marriott Basin, yeah. It's lovely there. It is. It has been. I've been up there many times. Um, Lisa asks, uh, and maybe this is a good question for Sabrina, and I think I have some ideas myself, but uh, are there any snowshoeing trails that have rentable uh, snowshoes. So for people who don't have snowshoes, are there places you can rent snowshoes and then go straight onto the trail? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, certainly, you know, Cypress uh, and Seymour and Grouse, uh, all which have amazing trails and parks, you know, in some cases and the Sea to Sky Gondola, they all offer snowshoe rentals. Um, and another great option that I used for many years before I, you know, got my own pair is mountain equipment co-op actually. Yep. You uh you can rent uh rent snowshoes and other winter gear uh right in the city and then just take off to your your end destination. So lots of great options for renting. Yeah, and I know as you go further north, uh Whistler Olympic Park uh and uh Lost Lake uh all, both also have uh rental snowshoes uh and have snowshoe trails right there. Uh so those are also good options. Uh, Brent, do you have any other ideas of uh, uh, where you can rent snowshoes so that you can go a trekking? Yeah, no, those are the the big ones there, and it's great when when they're right next to the trails. So those are yeah. great options. It also gives you, from a safety perspective, uh, they intend on getting their equipment back at the end of the day. Uh, and <laughs> if <laughs> if 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 you don't come back, uh, then they start wondering where are you, and that actually is somewhat helpful actually having someone uh, questioning it in any instance no matter what you should have someone who's wondering where you are if you're overdue that's a part of our trip planning portion do that no matter where you're going even if it is in a in a place where they rent you snowshoes start with your trip planning make sure you have the training you need and then take the essentials even if you're up at grouse put on that backpack make sure you have your essentials because you know what from grouse you can get really far you can go out to crown mountain you can go down into the haynes valley by accident like you can go really really far i don't recommend it in fact it's closed in the winter but that doesn't necessarily prevent you from making mistakes uh and so make sure you have everything you need just in case really important uh tessa wonders are there any issues with mice in the winter when storing food mice or let's let's say any wildlife uh yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of the huts are uh, are permeable, um, and some more than others. I know uh, some of the newer huts, like the Keys and Claire's hut that were mentioned, are are less permeable. Um, but uh, wildlife is always trying to get into nice, warm, dry places. The same reason why we're trying to get into nice, warm, dry places. And so um, we kind of use the same principles as we do in the summer. So hanging food up. Um, so that little critters can't get to it. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm happy to say that I didn't really see many signs of mice at the Wendy Thompson hut, but you know, with those huts, it's always kind of one of those things that you have to be aware of. That's what's nice about sleeping in a tent is you don't have to worry about that stuff at all. Um, they're not crawling around out in the snow. <laughs> well, and, and in the winter, you, there's no bugs too. It's one of the reasons there's why no bugs. I actually yep. love winter camping more than yeah. like spring camping because May is horrible Absolutely. for bugs but yeah. i can go and will go this upcoming weekend and it there will be no bugs i could leave the tent completely open nothing's going in it's great oh yeah oh yeah it is <laughs> um speaking of winter camping uh along this the duffy lake road there on the north side you have the merit base on the south side you have cerise creek you have all of those different areas are, uh there are huts all along there as well are you allowed to camp outside the huts without reservations so in other words are like can i just set up a tent or like you said build a quincy do i need to have reservations for that or can i just set up a uh pretty much anywhere along that corridor that duffy lake corridor 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So as long as you're there's there's different rules once you're in a provincial park, but if you're outside of those provincial parks, then then you have the freedom to kind of camp wherever. Um, the, it is explicit. It says this on the door of the Wendy Thompson Hut that it's only there for for people that have booked it and for emergencies. And then they have a, a short list of things that aren't considered emergencies, um, things like looking in the hut to see what it looks like, uh, having lunch in the hut. Uh, you know, drying out your gear. Those are not necessarily uh, emergencies. And so um, what I have found in the past when I'm up there winter camping is usually people who have the reservations uh, are quite friendly and they might invite me in, but I only enter the hut upon invitation to the, the folks that have uh, have booked it. Um, so make sure you, you get a reservation when you, you, you go up there. So um, certainly things like the the outhouse are, uh, are are there for you to utilize. Um, definitely we want people kind of using those facilities properly. Um, but uh, as far as the actual, uh, the, the warm part of the hut, that is only for people that have made reservations. That actual tent that you had, do you happen to remember the name of your tent? It, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's called the Black Diamond Mega Snow. Um, and it's a four person floorless tent. It's wonderful. It's uh, I'm actually borrowing it from a friend and kind of learning how to use it. So it's only been my second trip in it and I really like it. Sabrina, you had mentioned a, a number of um, uh, opportunities in, in the back country as well. Uh, and like, are, are there any things, are there any places that you have gone personally uh, in the Sea of Sky back country that uh, uh, you particularly remember? Oh gosh, you know, I, I have to say I I've dabbled a little bit in the backcountry in in northern British Columbia. I've done a little a little bit in Squamish, like the Elfin Lake Trail and and kind of light light adventure uh, experiences like that. But uh, I I didn't didn't stay overnight at the hut. I didn't make my reservation, but boy, did it look nice up there! I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Brent, a last question to you. Where'd you get your foldable lantern? What's it called? Oh, yes. The foldable lantern. Oh, where is it? Uh, it is. Hold on. It's in my backpack. It's right over here. Okay. While he's doing that, I'm just going to let the folks know that we're uh, going to show you a brief it's video. And then the when you... The crush light. Fresh light. The crush light. Oh, crush and, uh, light. I got it from ah. MEC, Mountain Equipment Company. There you go. Um, but it popped up and it's great. And it's also got a, a party mode in it. So you can uh, <laughs> you can make it change colors. So I ah, very a little, nice. A little fun. party in my hut the, as well. The wonders of LEDs. <laughs> and, and that's the that's the thing about uh, when I went camping when I was a kid, I, I'm I'm going we're going over time, I'm sorry. But when I was camping as a kid, you would get a flashlight, right? And that yeah. flashlight, your batteries would be dead by the end of that night. <laughs> you would get like one hour of a flat uh, of totally. and it. You'd have like big D's batteries. Now I have a headlamp that I can use the entire season without replacing the, 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 the batteries. It's just amazing LEDs. Anyway, yeah. off on Life's a, gotten a lot more comfortable out there. That's for sure. I tell you. Uh, so we're going to go to a, a brief uh, uh, four minute video when we come back. If you're on Zoom uh, and you're ready to answer some questions and you haven't won anything in the last year or so, then we're going to give away some stuff, maybe a lamp, maybe a Reco reflector. In fact, yes, we'll probably do one of both. So just hang tight and uh, we'll see you on the other side. So, you want to be adventure smart. Mm hmm Good. Uh, but, but what is being adventure smart? Being adventure smart is really all about taking responsibility for your own safety and following the three T's. <laughs> Got it. Um, what are the three T's? What are the three T's? The three T's are the trifecta of outdoor safety, trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. The three T's can vary from person to person, activity to activity, and season to season. But here are some important ways to ensure you are prepared and safe on your next adventure. Trip planning. We could go on forever about this one. Trip planning is an essential step and one of the easiest ways we can stay safe on our adventures. 
This is something that should be done every time we head into the outdoors, whether for a few hours or multiple days. Trip planning can be broken down into four simple steps. Planning your travel route and navigation is about picking a trail or route based on its difficulty that's relative to your experience, ability, and the amount of time you have. Know your limits. Not all trails are created equal, so know the terrain and conditions. A 10-kilometer hike scrambling straight up a steep mountain is a lot different than a 10-kilometer stroll around a lake. Before you go anywhere, check the weather and keep checking it as things can change fast. This includes wind, precipitation, temperature, and sunset times. Finally, make sure you leave a comprehensive trip plan with a trusted contact. Keep in mind, this may not be your mom or dad or best buddy. Choose someone you can count on if you were to get into trouble. A comprehensive trip plan might be as simple as sending your trusted contact a text or email with key information about your activity, or using the Adventure Smart app, which allows you to enter a detailed trip plan. Training doesn't mean being an elite athlete or being queen of the mountain on Strava. Training is a continuous process of outdoor recreation. It's about developing the necessary skills and abilities to be safe. This might include working your way up to that big summit hike, taking a few courses to expand your wilderness and backcountry knowledge, navigation and route finding courses, or even learning more advanced skills like rescue and emergency training. You have planned and trained. Now make sure you take the essentials. Taking the essentials means packing everything you potentially need to stay warm, safe, and dry if an emergency unexpectedly arises. What if you rolled your ankle or got hurt? What if you got lost and had to spend the night outdoors? Take the time and be prepared to look after yourself. So that's it. Those are the three T's. That's it. <laughs> But no matter how hard you train, how well you trip plan, and how much essential gear you bring, you may still find yourself in an emergency. And that's okay. The wilderness can be unpredictable. If you find yourself in an emergency, it's important to stop, think, observe, and plan. Use that essential gear you brought to stay warm, dry, and safe, and contact 911 on your emergency communication device. Remember, search and rescue in BC is free for everyone. Remember, safety is an outcome of good trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. It's your responsibility. So let's all do our part and be adventure smart. And there we go. Wonderful. Well, we've kept everyone a little bit over our time. Thanks for sticking around. We really appreciate it. Sabrina, thanks again. It was wonderful. Bren, always a pleasure. You're always welcome back. Both of you, actually. And Scott, for all the tech support, it's never uh, never a miss. It's always on par. We wanted to give away a couple of things tonight. We've got wonderful items from Reco and Bright Source, and everyone will receive a one month free trial from FatMap. So let's jump into those questions. And how we play the game here tonight is... You type in as fast as you can the answer. Scott has his eyes peeled, ready to roll. And the first person to give the correct answer wins the prize. It's pretty basic. It's fun. And it's short and sweet. And uh, and here we go. So get your fingers ready. This one is for the Recto, Reco Reflector that uh, we'll put you in touch with them after uh, via email. And Scott and I will help you do that. Sabrina mentioned so many awesome things about the Sea to Sky, and it's a popular area. It's a busy area for enthusiasts, uh, residents, and those that visit there travel from BC, from Canada, from all over the world. And it's one of the busiest areas for search and rescue in the province as well. So think about those search and rescue groups as well that, that frequent that area. We've got Pemberton, we've got Whistler, we've got Lions Bay, we've got Squamish, North Shore helps as well. Sunshine Coast puts in a little assistance here and there too. It's a big area and a busy one. One of the things that Sabrina mentioned, I'd like you to tell me what it is. She mentioned a wonderful campaign. What was that campaign called? She mentioned it right near the end of her presentation. Scott's patiently waiting. I'm patiently waiting. We're trying to see. Go ahead and throw it into the chat. Oh, someone may have put it in the Q&A. 
Oh, oh there we funny. go. Yes, we got someone who put it into the Q&A. And the answer is, don't love it to death. Exactly. And I and I picked that because it's such a great campaign. Uh, Destination BC and everyone who works on Don't Love It to Death have really put a lot of effort into it. And it's a great additional resource amongst everything else that DBC puts together. Uh, so let's move on to our, our second item here. We've got a wonderful item from Bright Source. It's an awesome light. I like yours too, Brent, by the way. That was awesome that it had party mode or whatever you called. <laughs> that was exciting. Brent talked about so many things specific to a really awesome region of the Sea to Sky. Thanks for sharing your adventure with us. He talked about something tonight that is a unique part of any adventure. And I know we talk about it when we deliver our Survive Outside program and our messaging and as well. What type of exhaustion did Brent mention that the group experienced as they were getting really close to the hut? I thought it was a unique uh, part of his presentation and it struck a bell with me. I can see some answers coming in there. So Scott will be the, the eyes on the winner and, and we can choose that winner as we move forward here. I think I think the uh, most people are saying mental exhaustion. Would that be right, Brent? Yeah, yeah. that's what I heard yeah. Brent mention, and it, and it, and it rang a bell for me because I talk a lot about um, the middle T that you just learned in the video training. We talk a lot about physical training. We don't always talk a lot about mental training, mental wellness. That that exhaustion that we'll feel, we're going to feel exhaustion in our legs and our body from moving through the terrain, through the mountains. But we also feel it mentally. So thanks, Brent, for bringing that up. I think it was a, an important piece to share. Something that your group experienced, obviously, and it looked like everyone had a wonderful trip to the region. As we come to a close, I'd just like to thank everyone again, and that includes the participants who joined us this evening. You know, you've taken the time to get prepared a little bit more, maybe sharpen your pencil a little bit, learn from Brent, learn from Sabrina, learn from Scott, and learn from BC Adventure Smart. On behalf of the 3,400 search and rescue volunteers in the province of BC who respond to 1,500 calls a year, thank you from all of them to you for getting prepared. Have a great winter, however it looks, rain, sun, sleet, Bulbs coming up through the garden, minus 28 at the peak. Take what we get. We'll run with it and enjoy the rest of the winter. And hopefully we see you on the next couple of webinars we have coming up. Thanks again for your support. Good night. Good night, everybody.